This is the English On Air podcast where we interview interesting guests and teach English at the same time. Recently, I was lucky enough to interview a dear friend who I've known since living on the same street during our childhood. He's a doctor, a pathologist and a writer and he is going to be talking about the story behind his new book which is released on the 25th of June 2021. So it's my old mate, Norman Mounter. Just give us a little intro into where, you know, where the passion started from. So, for example, if we spoke about, if we spoke about history, I mean, where, where did the passion, where did that sort of come from? When I was a young boy, I, I used to be very interested in castles and things. And I remember my dad taking me to Dover Castle for the first time, and that was you know, really fascinating. And it, it began to make me feel this kind of uh, connection with the past and wanting to know more about these these artefacts and these buildings particularly. And then I suppose from there, it kind of evolved into other areas of history that I learned at school. And I, I was always very, you know, very absorbed by history. And it's a it's a strange one, history, because, you know, it can really turn some people off. And I remember some people in my class being, you know, pretty much, well, you know, why are we learning this? This is a complete waste of time and I don't, I don't need to know this. But uh, for me, it was about um, a connection with the past. And I think having that understanding of the past, especially in terms of the chronology of the past, which I think is seriously lacking in schools these days. These days, you tend to pick up a subject like, I don't know, the Spanish Armada or Queen Queen Victoria, but it's it's not really in, in any context. And you know, you ask someone when Magna Carta was signed or when the you know Spanish Armada happened, they they got no idea. And I think for me, it was it was about that sense of yeah, things have happened over the last few millennia, and we are basically living in a world at the moment that is just so much. It's so much entwined in the past. Everything we do. Everything we we say is all about other people that have uh, developed language, the clothes we wear. How would you know? How would we be here today? You know, talking to you, John, without people in the past that have invented electricity and you know all that kind of stuff. And for me, to understand the past gives me not only a sense of orientation in the present, but it helps me to certainly, as a writer, empathise with the characters and the backdrop to my novels that help flesh out the characters, but also give it that kind of realism. Not a realism that I can prove because I was never there, but a realism that feels real to me. And I think that's that's the most important thing for me. It's it's can I can I get inside this character and almost be there in a time machine, but not really. Hopefully my readers will be able to experience that as well, you know, go into that world that I that I feel is is real and and see if they feel the same. OK, well, go, I mean, go on to your your another passion. You became a doctor um, a long, long time ago now, Norm. <laughs> but you yeah. became a doctor. So you obviously developed a, an interest, a deep interest in, in medicine at, at some point. Knowing you as a boy, it wasn't the question of the, that you wanted to be a doctor from day no. one. No, absolutely not. I think for me, and it may be the same for other people, but particularly me, I even at school, I had no particular area where I said, you know, I must do this. Even up to my A-levels, John, I was kind of, well, I'd like to do science A-levels, but actually I love history so much and I love English so much. I must do those. So I ended up doing a kind of mixture of sciences and arts subjects at A level but it wasn't really until my second year of A levels that I thought you know what I think I want to do medicine I felt that my my interests were developing particularly in the kind of biological sciences I had a fascination for uh, particularly physiology and the anatomy of the human body I really wanted to kind of drill down on the fabric of the human body and really just you know just explore it like a new planet almost and of course very few degrees can allow you to do that apart from medicine. Medicine, certainly when I trained, I felt very privileged because people would give their bodies to medical science and we were able to 
uh, dissect these bodies over over the course of the first two years. And basically, through their sacrifice, we could learn, as I say, the, the fabric of the human body. And I think for me, that was an, a massive, a massive privilege for me and also something that I'd always wanted to learn. When it came to a human being, you can imagine this is a completely different sense of awe for what you are allowed to do with this person and knowing that this person had given their body for that was was a massive privilege for me and I'll never forget that. That's something that an experience that I've never had is is basically having a a dead body, a cadaver in front of me and then being able to cut and probe and dissect, you know, it. Uh, that must be ama- absolutely amazing. So I I think I think it was amazing for me, John. I think others, certainly other people in my year did not like it. And I think you'll find that it depends on the personality of the person. But, um, you know, it does it, it can either make you feel completely freaked out and and almost, you know, scared uh, to even go near it or it or it can draw you in. And for me, there was a mixture of both. I obviously was tentative and scared to make that first incision in something that was actually a living human being only weeks uh, before. But I just felt, you know, this person has given their body to me and my colleagues. Therefore, it was only right that we we use that body to further the next a generation of doctors and and carry on with that i think if we if we'd all have uh, rejected the body the cadaver as you say that would be an insult to the person that had left it no yeah i i totally get that but how did you react um because obviously in the human body even with my rudimentary knowledge there's things that would turn and smells that would turn most people's stomachs um how did you deal with with getting through those barriers or, or was it something it just was easy for you no it wasn't easy um i must just explain two things really there's a difference between doing a post-mortem examination which is basically an examination of someone after death where the body has not been in any way tampered with so the body is literally uh, refrigerated until you do the post-mortem so then when you do the examination these smells and things that you talk about they can be difficult to deal with I agree and I remember my first post-mortem as a medical student which wasn't until my third year and that was a completely different experience from the from the days of my anatomy anatomy when I was learning was uh, performed on a cadaver that had been already embalmed so these bodies had been embalmed in formalin you you essentially access one of the main veins in the leg and then you, using a pump system, uh, perfuse the entire body with a solution of formalin and that fixes the tissue, stops it from, from rotting. So it, w- it was a long time and there's no way you could do that without having some sort of uh, you know preservation. The old way of doing it, of course, was to literally pickle the body, either in vinegar or more commonly alcohol, I know that when Nelson died at Trafalgar, obviously that's quite a long way away from England and he had to come back for his state funeral. The the sailors put him in a barrel of brandy, I think, or some sort of spirit. And that's how he he was preserved (laughs) until he came back to England. But yes, so with with regards to the dissection, yes, there are smells, but it's much more about a smell of formalin, which is a a unique smell you get used to it after a while but it, it isn't necessarily an unpleasant smell okay so coming to your your third passion that i wanted to introduce to everyone today uh, or, or make them aware is as literature as you're a writer and also language i'll put those two together yeah i think you can probably recall john that when we were both young boys back in the 1970s we both had this drive in us to to write and I remember very keenly that both me and you used to keep these little notebooks and we'd be scribbling away day and night writing these fantastical stories and don't forget this was at a time when it wasn't particularly I mean it wasn't very common for a boy to do this I don't think but we seemed to have this uh, desire to write and I remember at school one of my primary school teachers 